Hi micro folks, this is our last video for um, Bio440 Lab Chapter 20 protists. So this was just to finish with a last bonus protist, um, Trichonympha, which are these really cool um, symbionts that live in the intestines of termites. They provide the cellulase that help termites digest the cellulose and plant cell walls. So we'll just hit on those very briefly. And then I thought um, again, just as optional, I'll just go through these PowerPoint slides as a quiz, just to kind of um, hit some key points. So trichonympha, they are um, flagellates. As we mentioned, um, they live in symbiosis with um, termites. They live in the intestinal tract of termites. And if, if we can, if we have some termites, we'll do what's called a, um, a squash prep. We'll decapitate the termites so they don't suffer. We'll pull out their intestinal tract, um, we'll smash it with a cover slip, and we'll look for these amazing intestinal symbionts. So what we'll, what we'll hope we'll see are these incredible um, flagellated symbionts called trichonympha. Um, some of the flagella are belong to the trichonympha, but others are these really cool um, spirochetes. Um, just an amazing relationship between um, the trichonympha and their symbiotic bacteria, and then of course the symbiosis with the, um, the termites, so kind of almost like nesting dolls. So um, we can see there's lots of different um, protists that can live in the termite gut, and the only one you'd have to know, and again this would be bonus, would be for the, would be trichonympha. And um, this was just a little blurb here. So at one time, it, it, it was believed the trichonympha themselves didn't have the genes to make cellulase. They thought it was actually endosymbiotic bacteria that lived inside the trichonympha that made the, um, the cellulase. But it's now been shown that they actually can make the cellulase themselves. So the point being is that the termites, as members of Kingdom Animalia, they don't have the, the genes um, for cellulase the enzyme that would hydrolyze cellulose and release the glucose subunits. So it's only through these uh, microbial symbionts that the um, termites can digest the wood, the cellulose. And that's just that little tidbit right there. There are some additional slides, but those would be just if you're interested. And again, folks, what I thought we could do is just, we could just go through these slides um, and we could do some just kind of quiz questions here. So we'll just look at the slides. So um, one question would be, why do we consider the protozoa animal-like? So we want to remember they're chemoheterotrophs. They have to have preformed organic molecules as a source of carbon and energy. They lack cell walls. Um, they often have an ingestive form of nutrition, and many of them are motile. So these are all animal-like characteristics. So um, paramecium questions we could ask you. Is it a prokaryote or a eukaryote? Um, what are the structures used for motility? Um, are they free living or parasitic? Right. And then we could ask you um, about this, about structures. For example, if we had a photograph or a model, we could ask you to identify the cilia, the oral groove or gullet here, um, contractile vacuoles. And remember that's to pump out excess water to prevent osmotic lysis. And do remember that all the ciliates, they have a great big macronucleus and then a much smaller micronucleus involved in sexual reproduction. We'll have um, living cultures of paramecium, and, and they're beautiful in wet mounts. They look like big battleships kind of cruising through the terrain. And then um, our next free living protozoan, Amoeba proteus. So want to remember they use pseudopods for motility and food acquisition for phagocytosis. Um, so on a on a diagram or a model, you'd want to identify the pseudo, pseudopods, pseudopodia, um, be able to identi identify the food vacuole, also called the phagosome, be able to identify the nucleus, and again, the contractile vacuole. Euglena, you'll recall, folks, that euglena in evolutionary history started out as a protozoan animal-like protus, but through secondary endosymbiosis, it acquired um, algae that started living inside and eventually the algae evolved into chloroplasts. So in the light, euglena is a photoautotroph, 
and we'll see on the models or diagrams the chloroplasts. We'll also recall you guys that there's a, um, a stigma or eye spot that's part of the photo detection system of euglena. Um, so euglena in the light exhibits phototaxis, a movement along a light gradient. Um, let's see here. We want to recognize that in the dark, euglena becomes a predator, a hunter. Um, and is a chemoheterotroph. So we call that combination of photoautotroph, chemoheterotroph, a mixotroph. Um, let's see here. And we do, we, you would on a model or a diagram be able, you want to be able to identify the flagellum. So moving into our um, intestinal protozoal pathogens, our fecal pathogens, and we just mentioned too, we will not have balantidium coli on our lab exam. You'll recall that um, Transmission is fecal orally, and with the intestinal protozoal parasites, they have two forms, the tough, resistant cis form, which is the infectious form, and then the delicate, feeding, metabolically active, um, actively dividing trophozoite, which, which causes the actual um, clinical signs and symptoms. Entamoeba histolytica, so it is an amoeba, so it uses pseudo, pseudopodia for movement and for ingestion. Um, the trophozoites um, in the intestine will attach to the surface of the intestinal epithelial, um, form protein pores in the epithelial cells, um, kill them, and then eat them. So we often end up with a bloody dysentery, so the feces has mucus and um, blood in it. Sometimes it's called raspberry jam feces. and the entamoeba can be invasive. They can invade, um, for example, they can end up in the liver causing liver abscesses. And we can have asymptomatic carriers. The infectious form, again, is the cyst, right? So this is the form that we swallow in fecal contaminated food or water. Just the life cycle. Giardia is really common here in California. So again, fecal oral transmission, possibly zoonotic. Um, the infectious form is the cyst, and as the cyst passes through the intestine, the hydrochloric acid um, activates the cyst so that it will exist, releasing these cute little trophozoites in the intestinal tract. So you'll recall, folks, it has kind of a teardrop shape. It has two nuclei, so if you get the orientation just right, it looks like the trophozoite is looking back up at you like a Gary Larson cartoon. Um, fortunately, the GRD are not invasive, like the Entamoeba histolytica, but they will use a ventral sucking disc to attach to the surface of our um, intestinal epithelial cells. And if there's lots of them, they can pave the surface of the intestinal, intestinal cells so the intestinal cells can't absorb nutrients properly and fluids properly. So you, you'll end up with a fatty, foul-smelling diarrhea, abdominal pain, um, and if people are chronically infected, it can cause a wasting syndrome because of malabsorption. Um, there, as we said, it, it might be zoonotic, but probably one reason that most of the fresh water here in California is contaminated with giardiasis is probably from um, human fecal contamination. Our arthropod arthropod-born pathogenic protozoa. So here we'll do Plasmodium, the female Anopheles mosquito is a vector. Trypanosoma brucei causes African trypanosomiasis or sleeping sickness. Glycina or the tsetse fly is a vector. Trypanosoma cruzi, which causes American trypanosomiasis or Chagas disease. The reduvid um, insects, for example, Triatoma are the vectors. So we're going to be looking at blood smears for these. Oh, um, in a and for the lab exam, folks, if I say um, you're at a station and there's a fecal smear, remember the only two pathogens it could be for our lab exam would be Entamoeba histolytica or Giardia. And likewise, if we have blood smears, folks, on our lab exam, it's going to be one of these three um, vector-borne pathogens. So with um, plasmodium, remember the female Anopheles mosquitoes is the definitive host, so sexual reproduction occurs in the um, mosquito, after she um, takes blood from an infected host, she sucks up the gametocytes, they undergo the process of fertilization, and then um, eventually we're going to end up with the plasmodium parasites in the salivary gland. So the next time she takes a blood meal, she injects the plasmodium, 
Within about 30 minutes, a plasmodium, plasmodium reach our liver. They invade the liver. They carry out asexual reproduction in the liver. <coughs> and then next, the plasmodium, as they exit the liver cells, then are going to invade the red blood cells. Right? So we'll go through cycles of um, asexual reproduction and lysis of the red blood cells, which will bring on the malaria attacks, the fever, the chills, um, flu-like symptoms like muscle aches, and then ev eventually sweating. And we said that plasmodium falciparum is the most dangerous of them. Um, it can cause blood clots to form, it can lead to cerebral malaria. Um, damage with all of them includes anemia, damage to the um, kidneys. Um, it's a major killer of pregnant women and children under the age of five. There's a horrible statistic like every 30 seconds, a child somewhere in the world dies of malaria. And, and do recall there's been some natural selection for um, humans that are resistant to the malaria. And one, probably the most famous um, resistance is if you are a carrier of this sickle cell allele, this will protect you against the devastating effects of plasmodium falciparum malaria. But the, the, the heartbreak here is if you're homozygous, meaning you have two copies of the sickle cell allele, then you can suffer with sickle cell disease, which is really tough. <coughs> In our blood smears, we're going to be seeing um, infected human red blood cells. So we'll see the, um, the plasmodium replicating in the red blood cells. This is an example of the gametocyte that's formed within the red blood cells. This is the infectious form for the mosquitoes. We want to remember that we do have our own California malaria mosquito, Anopheles reborni, the Western malaria mosquito. We were once endemic for malaria. It's been only through mosquito control and, and um, malaria treatment that we're no longer endemic, but because we have the vector, this means that in the future we could become endemic again. <coughs> trypanosoma. Trypanosoma crucii, um, Chagas disease, American trypanosomiasis, found in South America, Central America, and, and we're also seeing it in um, North America. So the vector are insects, blood-feeding insects, um, often referred to as reduvid bugs or insects, and a specific type is the triatoma sometimes called the kissing bug or assassin um, assassin insect. So usually they'll come out at night while we're asleep. They'll crawl up onto our face. Um, they start feeding on our blood. And while they're feeding, they defecate. And the trypanosoma crucei is actually in the feces. So we might help wipe the trypanosoma into the bite wound, or maybe we rub it into our eye. And that's how we're going to get infected. Um, the trypanosomes can invade the um, intestinal tract. Chronic infections can cause megaesophagus, mega, uh, megacolon, and, and really damaging, they can invade the heart and um, in chronic cases can cause congestive heart failure, which is often, of course, will, will kill, kill the victim. Um, the, the reduvids, the vectors, like to live in dark spaces, so um, in endemic areas, living in like little huts made of mud or thatch, those are great hiding places for the um, reduvids. They, um, Trypanosoma crucii is a zoonosis, so opossums, um, armadillos, rats, raccoons, dogs. Dogs um, can be reservoirs, and in endemic areas, one study said that, that a risk factor was um, folks that lived in the presence of lots of dogs that could be infected. This is showing the bite, um, the, the inflammation at the bite site of the reduvid. Um, this is showing the Romagna's sign. Um, when the trypanosome um, get introduced in, into the eye, the mucous membrane, so we have this swelling Romagna sign. Trypanosoma brucei, um, there's actually two different species, but we'll excuse me, some species, but we'll just talk about them in general, trypanosoma brucei, the cause of African trypanosomiasis or sleeping sickness. The vector is glycina, right, a blood feeding um, vector. So um, the, when the glycina feeds on us, it injects the trypanosoma brucei in the saliva. So again, we can have an ulcer form um, at, this, at the bite site. The... Uh, 
the trypanosomes, um, we can see them in the blood. They're actually easier to see than the trypanosoma cruzii. And then eventually they can invade the central nervous system, um, leading to coma-like states. <coughs> um, one of the subspecies of trypanosoma brucei can have animals as the reservoirs. Okay, so um, some forms of trypanosoma brucei are um, zoonotic, potentially. And this is just showing the, the two different subspecies, so trypanosoma brucei gambiensis, um, and then the um, trypanosoma brucei rod rhodesiense. Yeah. And again, you don't need to know the difference between these two. Um, just out of interest here, the rodensiensis is more virulent. It can cause death more rapidly. Um, and actually, in the original video, you guys, um, I think I said that the primary reservoir of gambiensis was just humans. That was, that was from the medical microbook that I was reading. But it appears here that domesticated animals can act as reservoirs as well. <coughs> And that does it, folks. So we'll end this here. Okay. And let's see.